Welcome back to the Make Time for Success podcast. This is episode 94. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to take a totally different career path than the one you're on? My special guest today, Roxanne Wilson, is here to share several stories about her experiences with taking several different career paths. And she shares with us a lot of lessons that she's learned along the way. We talk about showing up, believing in yourself, and going for what you think is right for you. Roxanne Wilson has been a television host, radio personality, fitness professional, appellate attorney, author, speaker, social media coach for network marketers, and reality show survivor. We managed to talk about all of this in this one episode, and you're going to see how Roxanne is both a star and a total delight to be with. Let's go listen to this inspirational and fun episode now. Hi, I'm Dr. Christine Lee, and I'm a psychologist and a procrastination coach. I've helped thousands of people move past procrastination and overwhelm so they could begin working to their potential. In this podcast, you're going to learn powerful strategies for getting your mind, body, and energy to work together so that you can focus on what's really important and accomplish the goals you want to achieve. When you start living within your full power, you're going to see how being productive can be easy and how you can create success on demand. Welcome to the Make Time for Success podcast. Hello, everyone. It is Dr. Christine Lee on this beautiful spring day. I want to welcome Roxanne Wilson to the show. She and I are brand new buddies. We are colleagues and new friends. And I am just intrigued by her, even without knowing all the details of her life. So I'm excited to just interview her today and get her to tell us all about herself, her journey to the life and career that she has right now and to throw in a lot of different lessons about life that she has to share. Welcome to the show, Roxanne. Thank you, Christine. It's an honor to be here. And I feel very connected to you. And it's very exciting to, you know, just have this new relationship. So it's it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. All right. Let's start with all the good stuff. What would you like our audience to know about you and also what you're doing in the current day? Yeah. So what I'd like you to know about me I had a pastor a long time ago who said this to me. I was like, I don't know how to take it, but I've owned this. I am an, an occupational nomad. And I say that outright because I think that there's a lot of people who are not sure they're doing what they want to be doing. And so if I can give you license to just go for it, I'm all about that. Right now, what I am, I'm, I am a coach for network marketers. I teach network marketers how to grow their business on social media and how to create that platform I always call like social media, Instagram is the bar where you meet people. You don't ask them to get married at the bar. You've got to get to know them, get their number. And then the transaction happens offline. So I teach them that. But what that really means is I'm teaching women who have given their entire life to the world, to their spouses, to their kids, all the things, how to redefine who they are right now to celebrate that and to brand themselves on social media. Okay, terrific. For those in our audience who might not know what a network marketer is, could you start us off with that definition? Great question. Um, so a network marketer is someone who is companies like for um, or direct selling. It's also MLM is a, is a more antiquated term for it, social selling. So like probably the first one you've ever heard of was probably Avon or Mary Kay. More and more you hear of things like, like a Rodan and Fields is a more modern one, but that's who I help. Okay. Terrific. Thank you for that. All right. How did you first realize you were an occupational nomad? I love that term, but I really want to dig in and find out what the history of it is for you. Yeah. So I didn't know that. Uh, again, my pastor, um, Dave Haney, and when I lived in Austin said one day, he's like, you know, you're an occupational nomad. I'm like, the word nomad just is not something that in the 21st century you want to hear yourself described as. So I was like, I don't know how to take that. But it took me probably a decade, honestly, to go, I am an occupational nomad and that's okay. 
I grew up when I was four years old, I knew I wanted to be a Supreme Court justice, the first black female Supreme Court justice, which is very interesting now, like the juxtaposition, because that's now happening. It's a thing. And I did everything in my power from the time I was four on to go there. Told everyone that's where I was going. I was not afraid to say it because I knew it was true. That's what I was going to be doing. Somewhere in undergrad, I'll tell you exactly where, The View happened, the show The View, like back in its infant days with Barbara Walters and all the people. And I thought, oh, it would be amazing to have a talk show and be like the young voice on that. And so I really enjoyed that. But I'm like, but I'm a Supreme Court justice. You really can't do both. You can't do both. (laughs) It'd be kind of weird. And so I went about all things law. I clerked for the Texas Supreme Court after going to Michigan for law school and Baylor for undergrad. I worked for an appellate attorney. Uh, I was an associate attorney for an appellate attorney at a big firm in Austin. And at some point there, I realized I didn't love what I was doing. In fact, there was a motorcycle rally going on. They call it the ROT rally, the Republic of Texas rally in you know Austin. And it was like 11 o'clock at night. I'm working in the biggest most beautiful building at the time in Austin. I'm looking down going, wow, they're so passionate. They've come from all around the country to ride their Harley Davidsons back and forth. I'm like, I am not passionate about anything in my life like that. So I got down on my knees and I said, and I got up and I knew someone, something, I don't know, it was me, God, both decided that within um, three months, I need to be doing something different. That was the first time where I, I thought, I am not going to be doing what I said I was going to be doing since I was four years old. And I was sure on that. Now, I should mention, I was teaching jazzercise at the time and I taught jazzercise, but that was like my fun thing to do, right? The, oh, I'm a lawyer and I teach jazzercise. So about a week later, I got a call from the Baylor Alumni Association because I was like the young alumni thing happening in Austin, doing like just doing all the events and I was part, part of it. And they reached out to me because... Mark Burnett Productions was coming through Austin and was going to be doing auditions for the next season of The Apprentice. But a caveat to that was the day before the long cattle call lines, they were having an audition just for business people who graduated from business schools in Texas, where you could be guaranteed to sit down with the casting producers and all the things. I'm like, okay. So they were asking me to get the word out to Baylor alum. I'm like, sure, I'll do that. And then as I'm doing that, I'm like, wait a moment. I have a business degree. I've totally seen that show. I know you're fired. I've always said, I can do that. Why don't I audition? And so that's what I did. I went and I auditioned. And I literally said to myself, I was sitting in the audition. I said, you know what? I know that if I get another audition, like the next audition, I know I'm going to the finals. I just knew. I I knew I'm going to be on the show. I just knew it. You know, when you're in your 20s, you just know things and no one can tell you anything different. That's where I was. (laughs) (laughs) And it was true. It happened. So I competed on the show. I made it to the final four. Then I got fired on national TV. That happened. (laughs) And then I went on to, I gave my two weeks notice and I moved on from law. And what was interesting is as I did that, I had so many people going, are you okay? Are you okay? Like they really thought that I... I was having an emotional or mental breakdown because I decided to leave law. And to me, I just knew that was not what I wanted to be doing for the rest of my life. And I needed to make a change in that moment. So powerful and a beautiful story because it's like somebody put a whole biker rally in front of your door just to give you a signal that there is other things you could be thinking about. Wow. I've never thought of it that way, Christine. And you are so right. It's like, what is it going to take for you to realize to wake up? And for me, it took a biker rally. But yeah, that's so true. And that the other opportunity came in the same time frame. I just think these stories are really beautiful because they're kind of rescue stories Mm -hmm. of a kind that you are alert to what's happening around you and able to use your own energy and desire to take advantage of the things that are possibilities always, but happen to be big steps out of your comfort zone, out of your tried and true from your age of four path that you believe is the best path for you. It's a powerful, powerful story. And it's great. It's a great story. I'm so glad it worked out for you in that way. Well, thank you. And I don't want to make it sound like it was easy. 
I mean, the road after that was easy. But what you just said, I think is so poignant. I think about that for people who are going through that. What I didn't do in that moment, which I think I've been conditioned to, and I'm battling at different times in my life is I didn't go, well, what am I going to do? What is everyone going to say? Or how is that going to be possible? I said, next three months, I'm going to do something. And I allowed, I like heard it and said, okay, I accept that, which then opened doors where I saw, you know, sometimes if we're so fixated on certain things, we don't see what's right in front of our face. If I didn't accept that, that same phone call could have come from the Alumni Association, but I might not have realized, wait, that call is for me, not for all these other people. Yes. I have found that people, including 20-year-olds, by the way, tend to shortchange themselves, even when they are really high-flying, really talented, super overeducated people or well-educated people. So I'm wondering what part of you allowed yourself to listen to that message within you? How come you weren't resisting your own voice? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it probably had something to do with, at that point, I think I was still a dreamer, first of all, but also two things that I think were big. One was I had had a situation, frankly, I don't use to talk about this, but I was sexually harassed at the firm probably a month prior to that. And that was a very traumatic situation for me, which I think made me look at what I was doing in general very differently. And then I also had a realization around that time too, where I looked around um, and I thought to myself, in corporate America, not just in law, but in corporate America, sometimes you see this, like it's a bit of a rat race in in the way of people are grinding. And so they're not living life that's the healthiest for them. And I used to think before I was like, you know, that's not going to be me. I'm, I'm different. I won't be them. And then I realized, wait a moment, you know, if you hang around that so much, that could become you. And so in a way I got a glimpse into where I would be in 20 years. And I was like, I don't think that I want that. So I think it was a juxtaposition of those two things that made me go, okay, we got to move on. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry about the event that happened at the firm. And I'm grateful that you were able to use that for yourself and to take care of yourself going forward. And now I want to ask, what did your nomadic path take you to next? I probably and I lived happily ever after. That is not what happened. <laughs> Especially when you jump without a plan and a parachute, things happen. So when the show was over, I did a lot of speaking to um, women in business group, female women's groups, women in business, faith in business. I wrote a book about my time on the show that was about faith and business. A lot of people think you can't have both of those things. I think now people realize you can, but back then I don't think it was something that people were willing to, hey, you can be both and be successful at both. I also was trying to figure out, like, I knew I wanted a talk show and I thought Oprah, whoever would just come knocking. He's like, come on. That is not how it worked. I learned a lot about the LA culture. I was going from New York to LA to living in Austin all the time, just doing different interviews and different calls and all those things. And I learned a lot and I realized that I don't think I was ready for all that quite frankly. So I really focused on Austin. I ended up doing a morning radio show for iHeartRadio in Austin. And then after that, I, you know, still that yearning to be on TV. I really, I am someone who, and it's like, oh, you want to be on TV. But I really, for me, I'm emotive and I love to speak to big groups of people and impact people and TV. And I'm just comfortable on TV and radio. Like that's my, that's my jam. And so I ended up working for an international home shopping network that's actually based out of Austin. I even had a dinner, believe it or not, with Gail King. And she told me I needed to go to small town America and do like news and build. And I was like, I ain't no way, no how I'm not doing that. (laughs) I think it was it probably could have worked. Who knows? But I think part of it is you go to school, you're a lawyer, you do all these things. I'm like, wait, I got to go start doing what? I don't I'm not doing that. Everything in life prepares you for what you do in the future. My dad has always told me that. And so I did home shopping for five years and I went up from being like a head of host to director of sales and programming. 
What I'll tell you about what I've learned from that is when you're on TV for hours and hours, three hours, five hours at a time, speaking without a teleprompter and talking to someone you actually cannot see, but you're like envisioning and creating that relationship, that was amazing education for sure. But it was at that time after that that I realized, okay, and I did some stuff for like a magazine and also I was doing all sorts of different things. Again, the nomad. But I took a step back and that's when I ended up in network marketing. And for me, it was, I looked around and was like, wow, all my friends are married. They have babies. They're divorced already. And I'm just like doing this career thing. Not that it was bad, but I thought, wow, okay, let me take a step back. So I took a step back, did network marketing. I decided to be what they call, like, I'm just going to, I'm like, I don't have to think. I mean, I just do this, this and that. And okay, well, I am meant to think is what I've learned. (laughs) So. So I really was like, not a bull in a China shop. I had great success, but I very much was taking everything I'd learned from TV and radio and and business school. And I was like, we need to be implementing this into your business life life as a network marketer. And so that's when I realized that I didn't want to be a network marketer. I wanted to help network marketers and empower them. Okay. Amazing. Thank you for filling in the the latter half of the path. Now I'm going to shift a little bit and ask you about those network marketers, the people who decide to go that direction. What is it that draws you to that group? And what have you learned from working with that group? I'm presuming it's a very heavily female population. Is that right? It is. Greatest assumption. What has led me to that group, I think, is first and foremost, I think it's underserved population. There's a there's a stigma that network marketers have, and so people disregard them. And I think at the end of the day, because I've looked back on my life and I'm like, what is my like, what's my purpose? <laughs> Roxy, what is your purpose? Well, how do all these things make sense? And what I realize is what makes sense and why I've been drawn to doing certain things and really repelled from doing other things is I want to feel like I'm making an impact in people's lives. And in some ways also, I would say serving people who are underappreciated, undervalued for whatever reason it may be. And so where network marketers, again, as I said, people have this stigma to it. And what I know is that the people in network marketing are phenomenal. The women are phenomenal. We think that starting a business and I, you know, Dr. Christine, you and I, we both have online businesses, so we know what it's like to do that. But what I've learned is that's a scary thing for a lot of people. And most people have been conditioned to not even have a vision of what they'd want to create, right? But maybe nine to five is not their thing. So what do they do then? And network marketing is a place where you can, and we're in an influencer society anyway right now, where you can share what you have out there. So what I love about them, I am going to make sure I'm answering the question. <laughs> Um, is that I love who they are and I love helping them realize their entire potential. And for some, that means they leave network marketing and they do start their own business. For others, they might switch network marketing companies or they just continue with when they have. But ultimately, what I've learned about network marketing is that unlike anything else I've ever done, except for maybe being on television, it requires anyone in network marketing, if you're going to be in it for more than a week, All those things you think that you have solved in your life, those personal issues, the things that you just push down, they come brewing up and it's a mirror in front of your face. And that's what it is all about. So it is totally this incubator for like figuring out your own personal stuff. And so I love being a guide to help people do that. I love it. Thank you for explaining all of that. That really rings so true to me, not having been a network marketer, but being an entrepreneur myself, I can totally attest to the fact that the moment you press publish or send or put yourself out there with a product or a service, all the great (laughs) unworked through personal stuff comes up as well. And it really is a task to sit with feelings, to sit with the past, to sit with your ideas of what your future is going to look like or could look like and not freak out and not run away and hide. And of course, to be a network marketer or an online entrepreneur, you definitely cannot hide. You have to be present. You have to be energized. You have to believe in yourself and 
the things that you're selling. And that is a whole trick. And I would say you do need a coach (laughs) to get you through that process. And Roxanne sounds like an amazing woman to work with, with her experience. And the fact that she just knows how to put things from her own past forward, that you're not going to let resistance thoughts get in your way. And I'm sure you take care of your clients in this way as well. Could you share with us maybe two or three of your top tips that you share with your clients so that we get a sense of how you lean? Absolutely. And thank you for that. You know, when you're talking, something came up that I wanted to share as well too. This can be a tip for sure. It's a definite tell if you look at someone's social media profile, like a network marker, and if you see that they're posting all about their business or using corporate images and you don't see them, whenever I'm with a client, I see that. I will always say, hey, we need to see more of you. And what's interesting is like, "Uh uh-huh. And a a week later, they see nothing about them. And that's when I know like, okay, let's talk about this. You're not showing anything about yourself. What's going on with that? And I'm going to tell you nine times out of 10, it's I'm embarrassed to show myself. I don't feel good about how I look or I don't feel good about something that's going on with me. And that's why I don't want to put myself out there. I mean, that's like an immediate conversation that we tend to have. But I know that if someone is is hiding behind their products, it's because they're hiding themselves. My biggest, you asked for tips. My biggest thing is realizing that when it comes to selling in, in network marketing, when it's not a product that you've actually created, right? It's not your baby. You have to understand that the thing that's going to make a difference between why people shop from you as opposed to anyone else who's selling the same product or any place between where you work, worship, work out, and home, or Amazon, is really you. And so the more you hide behind your product and the less you show about those amazing things about you that make me think, well, I want to buy my hair product from Dr. Christine because I love her haircut and she was talking about it on the day. That is the thing that's going to make me, or we both have dogs and we, you know, we do both have dogs. Our dogs are usually on, like that (laughs) thing is going to make me purchase from you as opposed to purchasing from anyone else. And so the more we, for lack of a better word, whitewash that and take that away, the more we are, are disconnecting with our potential client or team member. Gotcha. You're making me think about everything we've spoken about even before pressing record today about showing up, about being women of color, being of minority status, and the different forces that might force us to feel like we need to suppress our voice or suppress our message or even keep ourselves literally hidden, hidden from view, keep our face off of the screen, defer to other people, all of these things that women tend to have to deal with as a group. I guess the pressure to conform, the pressure to not be too bold, the pressure to not be too loud or too salesy, all of these things we have as women in our heads, because we're really good at that. We're really good at taking care of everybody else's needs and expectations. But at the end of the day, what are we doing to really promote our own needs and our own message and voice? And (laughs) my own mind is just racing to get the next question because (laughs) I'm thinking about all these things at the same time. But you seem to have beautifully integrated your work and your experience and your personality together, which is amazing. And that you're an inspiration to women who really want to stretch themselves a little bit more. Thank you. There's a lot there. And thank you for that. And, you know, I think that being on a podcast or having a conversation is very therapeutic where you realize, oh, wait, this all does like the puzzle pieces do (laughs) make sense. Sometimes we don't stop and even realize we just do. Right. And so this is, you know, thank you. I appreciate that very much. You're very welcome. I'm still fascinated by the occupational nomad concept. And for me, what is so important is that you kept your eye on the prize and the prize was that you get to design your life. It wasn't a particular occupation or 
state or social group. It was that you wanted what happened to you to really match your vision for what you wanted for yourself. And I don't think we see stories of that as clearly as you've described it. We don't see that that often. So is there something you could mention that might bring someone who's on the cusp of acting that way to really trust themselves and go for that vision? Such a good question. And very poignant because I've, I had lawyers come to me after and go, gosh, I really wish I could do that, but I don't feel like I can because of X, Y, and Z. My um, constitutional law professor, she used to call it the golden handcuffs. When you get into, you know, the corporate world and all the things and you're buying all the things, all of a sudden you have the golden handcuffs. My thing to you would be someone who's like having that angst, you're feeling it. If you're listening, it's probably somewhere in your stomach or in your your chest is this. Think about life. It could be next week, two weeks from now, 10 years from now. If you keep doing what you're doing right now, will you look back on those last 10 years and be proud of yourself for doing that? Or will you be regretful or winsful for it? And if you think that you may have lost what might have been, go for it. What is the worst that can happen? Like, honestly, what I've realized now is that you can get another job. And people used to say to me, you can always go back to law. And I was like, stop saying that I'm not going back to law. But if that's the thing that's going to get you to move, then yes, realize you can always go back to what you were doing Someone will hire you. Oh my goodness. People are dying to hire people right now, right? Yes. Um, Go for it. Do it because you were going to regret it. We get this life and, you know, whether you believe we have a billion lives or one life, you still only have this one life to do, right? Like you've got this iteration. You don't, it's not Groundhog's Day. We don't get to do this one over and over and over again. And so make the most of it. We fixate so much on all of the bad things that could happen. And gosh, we have great imaginations. How about we imagine the great things that can happen and allow those to take form? Not to take us off on a total tangent, but I think you've just convinced me to get a puppy. (laughs) Because it's that kind of a thing. You know, if it's not a puppy for you, it's something else that, oh, we can think about how complicated it's going to be, how expensive, how annoying, how potentially bananas it's going to be. But if it's the thing that you really are desiring, you know, this is your life. This is the place to experiment and try and reach. And sometimes that is the joy in life is that you've tried, that you've really kind of taken the leap sometimes. And then you have stories to tell. You've got all these great stories to tell. There's a book I want to, I just finished listening to. I feel bad saying reading when I didn't actually read it, but I listened to it called Illogical by Emmanuel Acho. It is amazing. I highly recommend it. If you're if you're going through the should I go for it or not, it's all about stop looking for logic because the greatness is in the illogical and go. Yes. Thank you for that book recommendation. I love that. Could you let us know how our listeners can start working with you and or come into your circle? Absolutely. I am on Instagram at Rocks Talks. R-O-X-T-A-L-K-S. That's a great place to find me. And there, there's my link where you can find all things um, as well too. But I'd love to continue this conversation with you there and just support you in any way. Okay, beautiful. Everyone head over to Rocks Talks and follow her. She's amazing. And I can't wait for our relationship to blossom from here. Roxanne, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for bringing the inspiration, your beautiful story and your beautiful self to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Christine. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Hope you loved this conversation as much as I did. I'm going to see you next Thursday when the next episode drops. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make Time for Success podcast. If you enjoyed what you've heard, you can subscribe to make sure you get notified of upcoming episodes. You can also visit our website, maketimeforsuccesspodcast.com for past episodes, show notes, and all the resources we mention on the show. Feel free to connect with me over on Instagram too. You can find me there under the name Procrastination Coach. 
send me a DM and let me know what your thoughts are about the episodes you've been listening to. And let me know any topics that you might like me to talk about on the show. I'd love to hear all about how you're making time for success. Talk to you soon.